Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming in from the rain. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as the Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House. And uh, on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, I want to welcome you to this program, and thank you for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to see you, and a pleasure to have some special guests like Joe Vitoridi, who's the head of our urban policy program and department at Hunter College, and uh, two, two people without whom um, we would not have a public program series at Roosevelt House. So I just want to thank and welcome Richard and Rone Manchel. Um, thank you. Before I turn uh, the program over to Owen, I just um, want to remind you that you're in the home of uh, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. You're in the place that served as the transition headquarters for the 1932-33 uh, interregnum. Um, and in this building, a couple of floors up, was hatched a series of programs that became known under the umbrella of the New Deal, including social security, child labor laws, minimum wage, maximum hours, but also the first ideas about government investment in, in, um, in development projects uh, around the country. And um, we still see the results of that every day. Um, Roosevelt's uh, Works Progress Administration and Public Works Administration, which they began talking about in the library upstairs, came to include oh, the Sixth Avenue subway extension, public swimming pools, Jones Beach, the Triborough Bridge, the FDR Drive, aptly named. But I always tell people, particularly those who are irritated by the noise outside our doors, that in one of the most selfless acts of uh, public development that Roosevelt undertook, um, federal funding was used to authorize the 65th Street transverse um, that goes from the west side right past our doors with trucks and honking horns. I can't tell you how many film shoots have been interrupted. People say, why is there so much noise outside? I said, FDR. So anyway, I'm also proud as a, an eight-year veteran of the Urban Development Corporation in the Mario Cuomo administration to be welcoming this discussion um, um, that dates to the antecedents of Mario's involvement in the UDC and mine, needless to say. So with that, welcoming you all again, I want to turn it over to a man who's written about Robert Moses, among other things, Owen Gottfried. Owen. So uh, we have such a, an array of luminaries here, uh, urban history luminaries, that I'm not going to take up very much time. But I do want to just briefly point out that this particular event is just a, um, it's, we're in for a real treat, but also it brings together two of New York's real gems. Uh, and they are small institutions with a great impact, and by that I refer to the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute and the Skyscraper Museum. When we were in the Department of Urban Policy and Planning, uh, when we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to recruit Nick Bloom to join our faculty, uh, Nick contacted me and said, there's one thing that I'm hoping you can help me with. I had this event that we were planning that was going to be this uh, uh, array of new books out about the state and the impact of the state on cities, and it's co-sponsored by the Skyscraper Museum. Can you host it somewhere at Hunter? And I said, yes, indeed, we can. Um, and that was an opportunity for me to connect multiple worlds of mine. Uh, I've been involved in the Skyscraper Museum since it was uh, originally an idea of Carol Willis's. Um, tw 21 years ago, we had no home. We were migrant. We were, we were uh, uh, wandering up and down Wall Street uh, begging for space. And there was space. But uh, Carol built an institution uh, one exhibit at a time, and eventually this is one of the only places in this great city where you can see exhibits that really get you to think about this combination of the built form and the city that we live in and how those two things relate to each other. It's a remarkably thoughtful, uh, compact, and, and 
always uh, exciting museum to go to because of the exhibits that she puts on. And then this is combined with uh, three speakers that I've known also for uh, 20 years or more in every case. We we're lucky enough to be hearing from three very, very well acclaimed uh, urban historians. I won't go into all their publications. Carol's going to tell you about it. But it it's, uh, so as soon as I said to Nick, not only can we uh, host this event, but is it okay if I introduce it? Because I have too, ma too many points of contact with all the people involved. Those of you that are new to Roosevelt House, I encourage you to come back. Uh, every week there are events that are about uh, important cutting issues in the public policy and human rights arena. And those of you that haven't been to the Skyscraper Museum, I strongly urge you to make the trip down to Battery Park City to see the exhibit. That It's a changing array of exhibits that uh, Carol mounts down there. I'm going to turn over the microphone to her now, but thank you for coming to this marriage of two great gems. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Owen, and thank you, Harold, and everybody who's here today. Um, Josh, can we go back to this, the slide of the exhibition? Because it's really because of Nick Bloom that we're here tonight, uh, because this exhibition, for which he is the guest curator, along with the, an architect colleague, Matt, Matt Altwicker, uh, housing density from tenements to towers, I certainly invite you all to come down. It will continue through January. Uh, to, to look at the role of public housing, but also private development in the span of time from about 19, the 1900s through the 1970s. And we'll be talking about the post-war period tonight and the role of the state. But as you can see in that, that slide, you have a combination of, of private capitalist development in the, uh, in the financial district, the entrepreneurial uh, energy of, but still, um, a for-profit development of the tenements of the Lower East Side, and then the role of government as it began to reshape the landscape of New York, especially in the post-war period, but because of the Depression and because of the New Deal. Uh, so those public housing projects that are in large part the subject of the exhibition and have been the subject of so much of Nick's work, and I'm going to hold up books now because uh, there are going to be books for sale and for signing after the event. So Nicholas Bloom's How, Shapes, How States Shaped Postwar America um, was part of the impetus for this evening and focusing on this middle scape of, of the spectrum of government, of federal, of local, but the state in the middle, uh, an enormously important vehicle for the funding of large-scale projects, um, but yet kind of un, underrepresented in the scholarship. And so when Nick came out with this book uh, last April, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to mention all, all, all of the books that our authors have written because that would take uh, you know, the rest of the evening. Um, these are, uh, are, are very uh, um, accomplished scholars with each one of, of the volumes, at least a decade's worth of research. Um, and then there's Nick, who writes two books basically every year. Um, and here's another one, uh, <laughs> Affordable Housing uh, in New York with uh, Matt Lasner right here, also of Hunter. Uh, so that focus on public housing is something that Nick brought to the, uh, to the exhibition and, of course, plays out in urban renewal projects um, across the decades uh, in, from, in, uh, from, the, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and up through the 80s, which is our subject for tonight. Uh, and then um, the, the evening is also occasioned by Liz Cohen's, Elizabeth Cohen's, Saving America's Cities, uh, a book that, through the lens of Ed Logue and those urban renewal projects, oh. looks at the different decades of, of development of city, uh, city rebuilding and through the urban uh, crisis. Uh, and then um, another examination uh, with, a, with a kind of um, a concentration of, of focus mm -hmm. Uh, actually, two books, one, one fat one I'm going to hold up, Power at Ground Zero by Lynn Segalen, who will be our third speaker. We'll start with Liz, um, and then Nick, and, and then uh, Lynn. Uh, looks, of course, at, uh, well, like the subtitle says, Politics, Money, and the Remaking of Lower Manhattan um, after 9-11, uh, uh, Ground Zero, and World Trade Center <laughs> rebuilding. She also is the author of Times Square Roulette, 
which came out in 2001 and is about the, especially about the UDC's uh, role in the redevelopment and, and uh, rescue of 42nd Street and Times Square, and she's now doing a, a sequel to that, which will bring it up to date, because 2001 marked uh, uh, Disney coming to uh, 42nd Street and uh, that what people perceive as the change of climate. So, um, real estate, politics, planning, um, individuals, overarching personalities in the, in, the, in the cityscape of not just New York, um, but we'll probably be focusing on New York City and New York State tonight, but also through Logue with, with Boston and New Haven. Uh, all of these topics uh, give us such a, a, a kind of uh, meaty and overlapping and interwoven set of characters that uh, that we can examine this evening. So I should get off the stage very quickly um, and introduce to you Elizabeth Cohen, who is a um, professor at Harvard. Um, my introductions are going to be informal and warm <laughs> rather than um, long and uh, detailed uh, uh, academic uh, um, CVs. Uh, Liz is a, a professor of, um, let's see, you're the Howard Mumford Jones professor uh, in the uh, American Studies Department in, in, at Harvard, but as well as a professor in the History Department at Harvard, and she was the director, the dean um, of the Radcliffe Institute for, uh, for Advanced Studies. Uh, she, uh, Nicholas Bloom, as you just heard, is uh, has just... Uh, come on board at Hunter in the in, in this first semester and has many of his students here tonight. And Lindsay Galen is is now Professor Emerita um, from the Columbia Business School, um, where she taught for many years and still conti continues to um, to teach uh, teach students and mentor students and uh, operate on a uh, level of um, of expertise. In, in real estate and politics that, that give a lens onto um, real world um, decisions that I think are, are exceptionally insightful. So, so we have a lot of people to bring insight to our, our topic this evening. Um, the role of states uh, in urban renewal. Liz. Now let's finally get set up with my Clicker, okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank Carol and Nick for organizing us uh, tonight. Roosevelt House for welcoming us um, to this venue, which is very beautiful. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of my work with you. The book, as you've heard um, from Owen and I think and from Carol, is is really about much more than what we're going to talk about tonight. It's I, I use Ed Logue as a vehicle to look at shifting strategies of urban redevelopment over really half a century, as he worked in many different cities. And I argue that there is a lot of evolution in these approaches to um, revitalizing cities. But tonight our topic is New York City and New York State. Um, and so I'd like to use my time to discuss a major collaboration between New York City and New York State that I think demonstrates all the possibilities and tensions in that relationship as they played out in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And my case study will be the New York State Urban Development Corporation, known as the UDC, uh, created by Governor Nelson Rockefeller to build much needed subsidized housing in New York State and to carry out uh, civic and industrial projects to revitalize the state's uh, many declining cities. In particular, I'm going to zoom in on one of the UDC's most important projects, which was the transformation of Welfare Island into, uh, which is in the East River of New York City, if you haven't noticed, um, into the new town of Roosevelt Island. And this was one of three new towns uh, that the UDC developed in New York State. Two of them were in upstate and then Roosevelt Island here. Um, according to um, the New York State Constitution, bond issues to support state spending on uh, housing required a ballot referendum. And after watching five bond issues go down to defeat, Rockefeller came up with a workaround. Um, he created the super agency of the UDC as a public benefit corporation or a public authority, 
to which he gave enormous powers, including the ability to acquire property through eminent domain, to exempt or reduce property taxes on projects, and most radically, to override local, often exclusionary zoning and outdated building codes, which um, you may be aware are often used to block uh, a subsidized housing construction. They were in the past, they still are today. The agency would be funded with a combination of state funding, federal dollars, and most uniquely, the purchase of bonds by private investors. And these bonds were in themselves controversial because they, to, in order to avoid this requirement of voter approval, they were moral obligation bonds uh, that carried the state's moral obligation to back them, but not its usual legal full faith and credit. Let me just find my slide here. So in drafting this legislation for the UDC, creating the UDC, Rockefeller consulted with Ed Logue, who had recently stepped down as head of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He'd run, stepped down, ran for mayor, which he didn't, wasn't elected, and then was kind of hanging out at, at BU. Um, and he called him up and asked him to um, he had been, Logue had had a big history in New Haven and then in Boston working in, in urban redevelopment and Rockefeller and his staff called him up and said, would you come and take a look at this legislation that we're writing? Um, and then they pushed it through the state legislature as a tribute because it was getting very, it was very difficult to get it through to Martin Luther King right after his assassination. And this, they, they managed to get it through over the fierce objections of many legislators who opposed the creation, as you can imagine, of such a powerful state, ag um, powerful agency that had this ability to override local zoning. And they saw that as an in invasion of home rule. Rockefeller then hired Logue as the UDC's president. Logue had um, already built a reputation for undertaking this large-scale urban renewal, as I mentioned, in New Haven and Boston. And on the surface, these two men couldn't have been more different. Rockefeller was a liberal Republican who harbored some suspicion of a strong federal government, uh, and he was the privileged heir to the greatest of American family fortunes. And Logue was an Irish Catholic liberal Democrat from Philadelphia. He came from you know, a very modest background, and he was a self-made pioneer of post-war, federally funded urban redevelopment, which he embraced as the next frontier of FDR's New Deal. But despite their differences, these two men actually had a lot in common. And as both of them were socially committed promoters of monumental projects who believed that the troubles of their time, ranging from poverty to poor housing, unemployment, inferior education, could be solved through major interventions in the physical um, environment. But the UDC discovered that building subsidized housing, particularly in uh, New York State, uh, which had, a, in New York City, sorry, which had a tremendous need for it in the late 1960s and early 1970s, was very, was, was often uh, easier said than done. And this photograph documents a press conference at Gracie Mansion, where Mayor John Lindsay of New York City and Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York State jointly announced the signing of an agreement between their two governments to work together to build subsidized housing in New York City. And Logue is sitting on the bench all the way there to the left. Um, this was a momentous occasion that I think reflects both the promise and the pitfalls of the partnership between New York State and New York City. And here, here's the back story. Lindsay had tried to hire Logue himself in 1966 to work for him, soon after he had been elected mayor. Um, and he wanted him to lead an ambition initiative to ambitious initiative to build thousands more public and subsidized housing units. But Logue had turned him down. Um, when uh, Lindsay couldn't or wouldn't, it was never quite clear to me, deliver the same level of authority over planning and redevelopment that Logue had enjoyed in Boston. So Lindsay accepted Logue's decision uh, until he learned a couple years later that Rockefeller had succeeded in hiring Logue. And in a raving 
um, raving mad late night phone call. Lindsay called uh, Logue and yelled, and I quote him, you'll never do anything in New York if I don't tell you exactly where, when, and why, end quote. Already, Lindsay and Rockefeller were serious rivals. They were both liberal Republicans vying in, uh, in New York uh, for leadership of the liberal Republican uh, wing. And nationally, both of them harbored ambitions to be president. Uh, but in fact, when Logue had tried to persuade Rockefeller that the UDC absolutely needed that controversial override authority that I mentioned to you earlier, he took advantage of Lindsay and Rockefeller's notorious uh, rivalry, and he argued, um, and I quote, if Mayor Lindsay doesn't like what you want to do, he won't do it. It will get stuck in his building department or his zoning board, and it will never come out. You'll never know why you're not getting it, but you won't get it, end quote. <laughs> Lindsay, in keeping with his threat in that late night phone call, stubbornly refused help from the UDC. And it wasn't just the rivalry with Rockefeller. The city had a long tradition of jealously guarding its home rule uh, from Albany, convinced that the state rarely compensated the city fully and fairly for burdens its projects put on transportation, on education, or the environment. Lindsay once put it, and I quote him, our cities cannot be renewed by state-operated bulldozers, which move into local communities without their consent and without knowledge and concern about the increasing need for supportive services connected with all development, end quote. But in the late 1960s, as the UDC ambitiously committed to projects all over the state, quickly lining up sites, Logue sent a message to Lindsay through an intermediary, they were not on great speaking terms, <laughs> saying that at the rate we're going, all of our funds are gonna be committed upstate and there won't be anything left for New York City. That warning worked. New York City desperately needed resources for new housing. As Jason Nathan, New York City Housing and Development Administrator described it, crisis is an understatement. Disaster may be more appropriate. Nathan finally convinced Lindsay, and I quote, to lock arms, not horns, with the UDC, to harness UDC's talents and powers to make them work for the city, end quote. And so the city and the state struck a deal culminating in this press conference in May 1969. And in the deal, the UDC would agree not to launch any projects in New York City without the mayor's prior approval, but they would pledge to build at least 12,000 units. In return, the city would protect the UDC's reputation by promising to clear the sites and handle any required relocations. That, of course, had been you know, a curse for urban renewal in many, many years earlier, and Logue wanted to make sure that they uh, were clean in New York. I should note that this deal did not heal the open wound between Lindsay and Rockefeller. At that very same press conference, Rockefeller undermined Lindsay when a reporter asked which candidate he would endorse in the next mayoral election, which was scheduled for the following November, sort of six months later. Knowing full well that it was possible that Lindsay might only receive the Liberal Party's endorsement, given the strength of conservative Republicans, the governor replied that he would support for mayor whichever candidate won the Republican Party's primary. <laughs> so an event that was intended to publicize a truce ended with another battle cry. Von Logue vowed never again to bring these bickering foes together in the same room. But the deal held. By 1971, half the UDC's total housing starts would be located in New York City, equalizing 30% of the city's publicly assisted housing construction that year. Lowe got from this deal what became the UDC's crown jewel, Roosevelt Island. And in return, Logue agreed to take on, building, take on building sites in the South Bronx and Coney Island that the city had found difficult to develop. Logue gleefully proclaimed, and I quote, I got the goat sites, but I also got the island. For Logue, Roosevelt Island was more than a place to build housing. He envisioned it as almost a utopian community, deliberately planned to be mixed income, mixed race, mixed age, handicap accessible, and pedestrian only with electric buses that move people around the island. 
Small schools and daycare centers were to be placed in residential buildings with the goal of bringing the diversity of children and families together. Roosevelt Island indeed developed as a joint city-state project with a lease from New York City for 99 years and a building program overseen by a subsidiary of the UDC, the Roosevelt Island Development Corporation. But there would be many challenges along the way, such as, first, a miscalculation by Philip Johnson and his partner John Burgi in the plan that they devised for the island that they miscalculated the number of units they needed for the, for the numbers of people uh, that would make the numbers work out. And that forced them to build taller on Main Street and also to put up some buildings on the water side and thereby block some views. Secondly, the failure of the MTA, recently taken over by the state of New York, to open on time the subway station that had been promised for Roosevelt Island. Uh, and that led the UDC to come up with its iconic aerial tramway um, from Manhattan's east side. And the subway station didn't actually open until 1989. And third and most seriously, the collapse of the UDC in early 1975, just when the first phase of Roosevelt Island was scheduled to open. And that further stalled a uh, building on the island for many years. I don't have time to go into the many causes of the UDC's downfall. We can, I can elaborate on that in the discussion if you like. But one of them speaks to the ongoing tensions between New York State and its local jurisdictions of cities and towns. In the early 1970s, Logue's UDC decided to take advantage of its statewide authority and achieve a goal that Logue had long sought to engage a whole metropolitan area in improving the lives of low-income city residents. So the UDC proposed what it thought was a very modest plan called fair share housing to build 100 units of subsidized housing in nine suburban and ex-urban Westchester communities. Well, as you can well imagine, that did not go very well. Uh, this angry uh, public protest meeting in Bedford was replicated in all the other eight towns. And relevant to my earlier discussion, although this dispute was between Westchester towns and New York State, one of Rockefeller's motives for supporting Logue's fair share housing plan, at least at the beginning, before the outrage became so difficult to handle, was to shift the UDC's investments away from Lindsay's New York City, where by 1972, 55% of the UDC's housing starts were taking place. In the end, the backlash against the UDC's fair share housing program led to the elimination of the UDC's override powers in New York, City, in New York State's towns, and ultimately contributed significantly to the agency's collapse and Logue's forced resignation in 1975. The contest between New York State and New York City as refracted through the UDC has demonstrated, I hope, that the presence of strong political rivals like Lindsay and Rockefeller mattered, but underlying it was a deeper, more structural and persistent conflict over control and power between New York State and its largest city. And at times, such as with that fair share housing program, its smaller jurisdictions as well. Although Albany's dollars were often valued, the state's offers of resources often met skepticism and distrust by state residents and officials who valued their local control. Um, I'll close just by saying that I visited Roosevelt Island uh, this morning with a reporter from the Commercial Observer who, wanted to write, who wants to write an article, and we noted that the city and the state still today exist in an unusual way, side by side on the island. Uh, the Roosevelt Island police, for example, are identified on their cars as part of the state of New York. The local school is PSIS 217, and the island is part of Manhattan Community District 8. Until 2068, the island will be run by the state's Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation, at which point it is supposed to shift back to New York City. We will see what the future brings. Thank you.
Well, good evening. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thanks to Carol for organizing it, and uh, also Roosevelt House, and I'm delighted to have joined my new colleagues at the Department of Urban Policy and Planning at Hunter, including my chair who's here, Joe Vitteriti. So I'm going to draw back a little bit, and uh, I think we got a really good sort of um, deep dive into a couple uh, projects of the Urban Development Corporation and look more at the sort of the broader what these programs, these state programs meant. And these are uh, explored uh, in my new book on how states shape post war America. And um, let's see here. Okay. So the the Mitchell-Lama program did not start with Nestle and Rockefeller. It actually uh, started in 1955, but it was, it was really having trouble into the late 50s, and it only took off thanks to a lot of changes which were made in the program post-1959 by the Rockefeller administration. So I'll talk about, oop, let me go back, uh, 11 ingredients, which I think led to this vast and still underappreciated, if not as exciting in many ways, as the Logue program in terms of dynamic personalities. Um, but I think it, it really helped set a pattern for state intervention in New York City, and also it provides a window, uh, really, about how New York State really operates uh, in New York City to this day. So the first of these sort of ingredients or steps uh, was to appoint an expert committee. And uh, for those of you who know who the Rockefeller administration, he was very uh, big on expert committees. Uh, this one with uh, Otto Nelson of the Metropolitan Life uh, Corporation. And this committee recommended major changes to Mitchell-Lama. Uh, among which were better intergovernmental cooperation, which I think Liz uh, noted was a, a crucial issue, um, more tax abatement. But the real key element of this story was to sweeten the deal, uh, to make it more profitable for developers to engage in the process of creating middle-income housing in New York City, which was considered to be a great risk for uh, post-war private sector developers. So he recommended that it be uh, the time to privatization of these projects be reduced from 35 years to 15. Ultimately, the state legislature re re um, reduced it to 20. And guess what? Uh, there was a lot more interest in Mitchell Lama with that reduction. The next ingredient was to dream big, right? And um, essentially, uh, Rockefeller, James Gaynor, and other people who were engaged uh, in the Mitchell-Lama program believed that a large-scale middle-income housing program could attract and retain the middle class in the city, which, I have to say, uh, was a pretty big dream uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and even this, they could be attracted to areas undergoing disinvestment. Now, some of their biggest dreams were not realized. And what you see here was the idea of... Um, this vision of one of the committees that Rockefeller created was to build a quarter million housing units over the, the city's highways and uh, rail infrastructure and so forth, which, by the way, wasn't a terrible idea. Uh, there were some financial problems with that, like the cost of building the entire structures that they would stand on, so it didn't work. Um, but ultimately, um, these kinds of really sort of dramatic visions were not carried out. But in the end, the, um, just on the state side of Mitchell Lama, there was a program of 165,000 units would be created by the mid-1970s, and most of them in New York City. So dreaming big uh, really did uh, work. Um, so you have to also designate or redesign a state agency, as Rockefeller did. Uh, he inherited a state division of housing, rebranded it as a state division of housing community renewal, and they really became the lead agency to develop an ambitious statewide program uh, rather than outsourcing the decisions to local government. And when you kind of think about the Moses era, this is being shaped uh, when urban renewal was under uh, a lot of criticism, and so, um, and especially local control of urban renewal. So local governments were partners in providing tax exemption and other coordination, but the state was certainly in the lead. The other major key was to how to pay for it. Now, the, under the Mitchell-Lama program, as Liz was indicating, um, the initial phase of it required a voter approval of bonds. And the voters were somewhat skeptical, I guess you'd say, or you had to keep the numbers down of the kind of debt that the voters would sort of swallow for their, um, in, in, in votes. So the key was to create this housing finance agency with tremendous power, and its particular power were the moral obligation bonds, which it basically were before, um, were created before, hold on a second. 
uh, the UDC. Uh, but what made the moral obligation bonds so exciting for state legislatures, uh, state legislators, uh, for Rockefeller and others, was you didn't have to get the votes of the citizens. And that was crucial. And so the numbers were shocking. Uh, which were basically approved by the state legislature, and they said, well, that's fine, you know, it's our moral obligation to stand behind these, but we're not fully, 100%, the, the, the full faith and credit of the state was not behind the moral obligation piece. Um, and these bonds were often sold, or usually sold, at rates of interest higher uh, than state-secured bonds, which meant that investors were very interested in these, um, and, of course, they, no one really knew what a moral obligation would mean in the long term. Uh, <laughs> As it turned out, it really was the same pretty much as a regular obligation because they came through. Uh, they did not default in the 1970s uh, on these bonds. But the key was the sale of these bonds to investors facilitated loans to private sector developers. That's the whole key of the whole thing. Sell the bonds, generate the capital, and they could be used by both private developers and nonprofits like the United Housing Foundation. This kind of socialist labor organization was the biggest user of Mitchell Lama funding. And uh, the whole idea was that the projects themselves would generate the revenue to pay off the bonds. Uh, in many ways, this kind of way of financing remains a crucial element with a lot of tweaks to the housing, financing agents, housing finance agency model, which remains dominant in the United States today. The next big piece of, this, of these ingredients was to target the middle class openly. And I, and I think the state was able to do that in a way that the city really wasn't. Unapologetically build self-liquidating projects for the middle class, you know, five to 10,000 in, in family income per year, which was a lot of money, uh, both for white and minority families. Some of these were well integrated, some of them were not. But the key was to create a program that sort of rested between the public housing program, which had lost a lot of its public support by this time, and uh, luxury housing, which there was some interest on the part of the private sector. It also had to be modern housing. Uh, and um, these were um, the, the projects which came up through Mitchell Lama were high rises generally with balconies, uh, open plan, open apartments, large units, space for cars very often, a crucial element, elevators, landscape grounds, uh, a new vision for the middle class in the city uh, that really in the past had only been available to the wealthy, those with more income. So where was this housing going to go? And this is where I think it gets very interesting. Um, we did some mapping of this. And while projects were often located in middle-income areas in the city, uh, there were a lot of them in lower-income areas. And I don't know if you can see it that well, but the, the lighter color areas are lower-income areas in New York City. Um, and the whole idea was that they were going to use this middle-income housing very often to stabilize, let's say, neighborhoods which were undergoing uh, disinvestment, and they hoped to, to basically do that. Um, they also did place an emphasis on um, sites that did not require slum clearance, because this is in the post-urban renewal phase. So that didn't work so well. Um, there, when you look in their papers and you look at how they talk about these, um, these early projects, a lot of them were small, and there was a general sense that using a housing project or two to stabilize a neighborhood was really very risky, that they couldn't create the kind of environment the middle class really wanted. And this was basically seen through uh, higher vacancy rates, et cetera. So they began to shift, and partly this was because of the enormous interest of the, um, the United Housing Foundation to build very large uh, cooperative projects. And you can see places like Rushdale Village or Co-op City, uh, these were designed to be basically enclaves in the city uh, for the middle class. That would include schools, shopping, community centers, parks, and more. Um, and uh, these were, uh, during the 1960s, some of the great hopes uh, of the Mitchell Lama program. Now there was criticism of Mitchell Lama. As the 1960s moved forward, um, the fact that they were building a middle income program that it was primarily white in a lot of its um, dimensions. Uh, this came in for criticism. So Rockefeller and his team also tweaked the program uh, with uh, various um, aids to people to rent and also to buy in uh, Mitchell Lama projects. 
And um, through these rent subsidies or loans for mortgage purchase, uh, they were able to, I think, in a very kind of progressive, contemporary way, uh, integrate uh, quite a few of the projects which were created. And I, I think you can argue this is sort of the, one of the originating points of the voucher programs, right? Rather than building separate public housing projects for very low-income people, make it possible uh, for people of lower income to live in these projects. Um, and this, I think, relates with, uh, to Liz's uh, quite a bit. Another uh, key ingredient uh, was to completely underestimate cost and complexity of building an enormous housing program of 165,000 units, right? So among the many problems which Mitchell Lama faced, which, of course, many of the Urban Development Corporation uh, projects faced as well, high vacancy rates, particularly in the 70s, many issues with the quality of construction, higher than expected maintenance costs, particularly related to the fuel crisis in the 1970s, a very public and completely damaging rent strike at Co-op City that basically uh, undid the um, United Housing Foundation. The white flight was a typical uh, in many uh, uh, mitchell Lama projects, and uh, quite a few projects were canceled. Um, and even at the tenant level, uh, many owners and renters dodged surcharges for higher income that could have uh, helped uh, settle the project finances. So these miscalculations meant that basically the HFA, just like the UDC, had to be bailed out by the state through a series of different uh, complicated, uh, basically, arrangements. The last and final step would be a long-term subsidy uh, and privatization and or privatization. Uh, the state had to recapitalize many of these large-scale projects in the 1980s to ex and um, this was the only way, basically, to extend affordability, um, while eventually others were allowed to go market rate. Where preservation has been achieved, uh, these are highly valued apartments and are often the most affordable in the neighborhood, and frankly, where privatization occurs, it returns property to full taxation, which was one of the project goals, you know, to get the private sector to invest. So what do we learn as a whole in our 10 minutes of, uh, or maybe 12 minutes, uh, about state government urbanism, or the character of states. A lot of these sort of kind of step back and look at the big projects and the big programs, I should say. So uh, among the uh, elements of mitchell Lama that I think are fairly typical of state government enterprises as they relate to New York City and other state cities in the state, the reliance on expert opinion, the designation of a very powerful state agency or authority, the uh, reliance on bonds or other debt issues as opposed to cash on the barrel head, a public-private partnership as a crucial element of that, an avowedly and openly middle-class target uh, where equity is, I think social equity is sometimes secondary, a modern image of living or whatever, or tourism, whatever it is, very because of the enormous uh, wealth which a state can bring, you get large-scale development. I think complex results, you end up debating a lot of the outcomes of this over time, and finally, a long-term impact on the shape and form of city life. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be here and to this work now and join uh, colleagues for whom I have the greatest respect for their work and from which I usually learn a lot. I'm going to advance the discussion to the 1980s and the decade of uh, the 90s and 2000s uh, by talking about uh, the state's role in large-scale, what I call city-shaping projects. Um, let's see if I can do this right. Okay. Uh, in the realm of the built environment, the state of New York has been a continuous player in the city's largest and most complex city building projects. And when I say advance the time, because by the time the 19, late 70s rolls around, UDC is a different kind of agency. It's an agency that's focused on economic development and large scale physical projects. And so what I'm gonna talk about are those projects, and in particular I'm gonna uh, compare and contrast 42nd Street and uh, Ground Zero, but these are the commercial projects on which the UDC then staked its uh, later reputation and rebuilding its institutional uh, uh, patina. Uh, since, the since its creation, uh, 
way the state involved, got involved in New York City was through UDC, creating UDC subsidiaries, subsidiaries which had the same powers as UDC parent. And since its creation, UDC's uh, urban arm formed over 200 subsidiaries, uh, and at least 35 of which were in New York City, mostly to facilitate what they called land use improvement projects. Only the largest of these projects um, are identified here. The Javits Convention Center was very early. Uh, we're still hoping that Moynihan, Pennsylvania Station will happen. Uh, as Liz says, you talked about Roosevelt Island, Queens West, Battery Park City, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Governor's Island, Atlantic Yards, and there are a couple up in Harlem. The map isn't obviously big enough for me to include um, all of these major, major projects. But when you, when you, you, you look, and, and not only that, UDC got involved in the city's building uh, fabric, not just by subsidiaries, but in other ways. For example, on the West Side Waterfront project, um, that, that lovely uh, replacement for the old um, West Side Highway was a state-driven project. Uh, the Bank of America Tower in Times Square was financed with Liberty Bonds. So the state has its fingers in lots of different uh, ways in, in shaping the physical environment, not to mention uh, at least the transportation of which the MTA is a major player. Um, due to the, its unique statutory powers, which Liz ably and happily described for us, uh, whenever ambition, public or private, spawn plans for large-scale complex development, the city turned to UDC as a partner uh, in executing those plans. It did so reluctantly, very, very reluctantly, uh, uh, because the city's, you know, it's home rule, but it's also sovereignty, it's municipal sovereignty. And the city found it need to turn to UDC strategically because it had these advantages that uh, were so necessary to the city's own ambitions. So, you know, regardless of whether mayors had seen the state's engagement on city turf as necessary or convenient, and sometimes it was one or the other, the intergovernmental alliance has not been without the inevitable tensions. Tensions that stem from different agendas, different constituencies. Think about it, the governor has a much larger constituency to, to deal with than the, than the mayor, as well as different leadership styles, which uh, Liz talked about uh, with the terrific example of Lindsay and Rockefeller. Though the state's role in each of the projects that I'm gonna briefly discuss uh, was radically different, there are at least three common uh, elements um, to these, two pro to these two projects. First project is the redevelopment of 42nd Street and Times Square, and the second is the rebuilding of Ground Zero. So the three issues that, the three elements are common is one, the issue of control, always is the question, who's in charge? The state's portfolio of powers can be seen as a potential threat to municipal sovereignty. Second issue is the issue of trust or distrust. Uh, the relationship between the top elected officials is either a facilitator or an impediment in reaching consensus on actions that are needed to move a project forward. The third issue, again one that Liz described so well, is the issue of personalities. The alliance of the governor and the mayor uh, is critically important in how they get along or don't get along and whether it is built on a mutuality of, of need. So let me talk about each one of these problems. First, Times 42nd Street, Times Square. A lot of us in this audience are old enough to remember uh, what the conditions were like on West 42nd Street. There was a host of pathological conditions and high crime. <laughs> That's a nice way of describing it. And, and high crime rates prevailed for decades. But cleaning up the sleaze and the porn of the street, affectionately known as the deuce, was what finally led Mayor Koch to action in 1980. Since the time of LaGuardia, mayors tried to, to clean it up, but they never had sort of the right strategy uh, to do it. The, um, ultimately, 
the strategy was a real estate strategy. And this was a strategy of clearing most of the 13 acres that made up the project area. New York couldn't do it on its own. It did not have the capacity, and its agent, the Public Development Corporation, which is now EDC, did not have the clear statutory authority to undertake condemnation, and the city's process for using eminent domain was seen as relatively slow. Also, the agency did not have the ability to do customized tax abatement deals, as UDC did. So reluctantly, very reluctantly, Mayor Koch invited the state into the project, and the state created a UDC subsidiary called the 42nd, ultimately called the 42nd Street Development Project, to execute on the city's ambitions. And it was the city's ambitions. It was the city that wanted to clean up 42nd Street. It had been a major civic embarrassment uh, for decades. As a prototype for tackling ambitious and complicated redevelopment efforts, city, this coalition between the city and the state uh, came to be a force that was used uh, in large-scale planning initiatives in New York City. And it proved the power of combining forces, uh, even though it was always a tension-filled relationship. The city and the state, this is a map of the 13-acre uh, redevelopment project uh, on 42nd Street. The city and the state carved up responsibilities in what was affectionately known as a natural division. <laughs> Since it was city land and city tax dollars and city interests at state, the city took the lead on negotiating the financial aspects of the project, even though sometimes the people doing the negotiation were state officials. Uh, the state took responsibility for project implementation. In reality, this division was not so neat. Uh, UDC's role by design was to be a broker and a vehicle for the process of getting it done. In negotiations, however, UDC was to throw everything back to the city because the state was not empowered to take risk, especially given the recent um, near bankruptcy of UDC. Tensions inevitably arose over major decisions as each player was responding to a different, uh, different constituency. Now, the situation at Ground Zero was totally different, okay? Rebuilding that hole in the city, that 16-acre hole, uh, that was the World Trade Site, as we can all too clearly recall, it still gives me goose pimples, uh, was a 9-11 driven <coughs> imperative. Without much ado, Governor Pataki immediately took the reins of power, uh, of reins of political power. And the state's presence was dominant, okay? They had legal and political, legal and political power was all over the site. Uh, the state, through the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, owned the site. The state had control of the MTA, whose Cortland Street Station had been destroyed and the state had control over Route 9A West Street, which was the adjacent site, the founding um, uh, World Trade Center site. So as, the, as had become the norm for getting things done in New York City, large-scale projects done, the, city set, the state set up a UDC subsidiary, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. Yes, there was city representation, mayor. Uh, make no mistake, the governor's men were in charge always in charge. And so too at the Port Authority, where the appointment of the executive director had been a New York State prerogative, New York, New Jersey appointing uh, the chairman of the board. At ground zero, as odd as it may seem to many in the room, the city of New York had absolutely no legal power. Okay, its only legal claim uh, was to the streets that had been left out of the urban, re uh, out of the eminent domain taking. So the only point of leverage was what the city could exercise over the streets that, that remained. The state and the city uh, would never be equal partners on Ground Zero. Uh, they were sort of equal partners on 42nd Street. Um, though each needed each other as the quotes, and, and I leave them here for you to read because they were so descriptive, uh, 
this was an alliance built on the mutuality of need. Uh, whereas the alliance at uh, 42nd Street was an alliance built of the city's need to have the UDC help them uh, uh, get the project done. At ground zero, battles were constant. And I like this image particularly because it shows the relative position of the three main players. Here you have Governor Pataki, who is clearly in charge. Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg sort of looking on. You see the size of his eyes, you know. Uh, he kind of liked to play, but he doesn't have a perch. And over here is Joe Seymour, who is the executive director of the Port Authority. Um, to explain how, in the absence of any perch, the city worked its way into decisions at Ground Zero would take more time than I'm allowed allotted tonight. But the mayor's office in time got fairly aggressive in trying to insert itself in the, proce in the process by way of what Dan Doktorov termed strategic interventions, which means using anything that they possibly could to get their voice in, in, in the game. In the end, despite their differences, these two high-profile cases illustrate in the realm of city development pragmatism rules over the city-state alliance. The, the alliance allows for a formidable concentration of resources, both legal and financial. Yet the power struggles are inevitable because the question of control is always lurking in the background. And resolution of that control issue typically comes through negotiation and compromise on any set of projects that the city and state are working on together. In conclusion, I would say that despite their differences, the details of each case reveals a clear lesson. In large, complex projects, it is essential for government entities to work toward an alignment of interests at a very tactical level. When the governor and mayor are joined at the hip, it is an incredibly difficult powerhouse to dismantle. Opponents find it difficult to upset that stability. Conversely, when government officials are not united, developers and other sophisticated players with stakes in the project are able to exploit the fissures among government agencies to their advantage. But when they are aligned, the inability to do so closes off that avenue of tactical maneuver. In both instances, at 42nd Street and at Ground Zero, there are instances of alignment and disalignment and it's striking how clear, despite the example, that lesson comes through in these fairly disparate uh, uh, examples. So thank you very much. I was going to remain recessive here because I, I could see notes being scribbled um, vigorously during, the, during each other's talk, so I'm sure you have comments um, or questions to ask each other, so please do. Well, I, I, something that was some opinion about this too, Nick, is as I watch uh, Logue's career, um, he starts off in New Haven and then even into Boston, getting a lot of his resources from the federal government. Um, and the state is there necessarily um, in, this, in Massachusetts, for example, this, and in all states, really, the state has to create these redevelopment agencies that will be the vehicle through which this federal money will, will flow. But really, the relationship between these people working at the city level is, to, is with Washington. They're constantly going down, making their proposals to HUD, they're not really, I just didn't see, didn't see a lot of interaction with the state until uh, the late 60s as when Logue comes here to New York State and starts working with Rockefeller. We've seen that some of it is Rockefeller feeling that federalism is really about states having power and doing things. But I also think as time goes on and the federal government is less of a player, um, has, you know, and it, it's financial in the 70s and then with Reagan it's ideological. That, 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 that the federal government shouldn't be involved um, at that level. What's the impact then 
on you know, this kind of state-city relationship. If, it's, if we see these as three entities of government, um, as one shifts, it impacts the other two. Well, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, what happens, you know, um, the urban renewal program is shut down in 1974. Reagan comes in. You have a series of block grant programs. And, and most of that money gets funneled through the state to the city. I mean, there was a period of time in the 60s and the 70s under federal categorical grants and aid where money went directly to the cities. That was unusual. My, my friends who have studied federalism have said that that was a rare period. So the states in, in the 70s, especially in the 80s and 90s, when the federal government is not helping cities at all, okay? They're block grants, but they're basically out of the business of helping support cities. Uh, then it becomes the state's role, and the states really take it up. Some states, I mean, California, uh, talk about state power at city level. I mean, they are redevelopment agencies, which didn't even have, they were, by enabling legislation, every city had a, a, a redevelopment authority. No longer, but they had. So the states really pick up the ball in the, in the 80s and the 90s. And it becomes a laboratory for, they become laboratories for experimentation because you don't have the federal government determining the rules. And so it gives the states ones that want to be aggressive and active, more power. And, uh, hello, oh. um, I, w I would just add also, if you go back in time, I think what, if you look at New York's uh, particular program with Mitchell Lama, um, and even the UDC, um, even by that time, the federal government is really stepping back from subsidized housing, and for instance, is not really interested in a large scale, for instance, urban middle class program. Uh, funding that. And I, so I think that the emergence of that in New York uh, was an opportunity uh, to basically demonstrate a different kind of urban planning, which was something that I, basically had failed, if you want to sort of think about it. While the federal government was fine with subsidizing the suburban uh, sort of growth, low density, I think that what we have in the city uh, through programs like Mitchell Lama and UDC was a really interesting um, attempt to create relatively high density urban middle class housing that is very difficult to sell, for instance, on a national basis. There were federal programs that made it possible for someone like Loeb to actually build a lot of subsidized housing in cities. One thing that occurs to me about putting the state back into a, this kind of powerful position um, uh, is one thing, as you kind of suggested, Lynn, tremendous variation over the country because you know every state is going to is going to take that up somewhat differently. But in many states, it also puts it into a political environment where rural areas and suburban areas have an awful lot of uh, power in state legislatures, and it puts cities in a in a complicated political situation. You know, what happens, I mean, when the state's got to distribute money evenly across all its constituencies, okay? So when money went directly to the city, it could focus its energies on the city. It didn't have to make compromises with Rochester or, or you know, Schenectady, okay? And so that, it does change, it does change the amount of, it, it, it changes the allocation of the pot of money and how it gets allocated when at the state level versus the federal level. And that disadvantages large cities, disadvantages downstate from upstate. Um, I, I, I want to comment on something that, uh, uh, that Nick talked about, which I didn't realize, uh, which is I didn't realize that the political compromise for Mitchell Lama was shortening the term of, of the loans. Because, and the reason I say that is because the mortgage on these projects is usually 35 or 40 years. So, so somehow the banks seem to have overridden that political compromise. And that's a really interesting initial political compromise because it, it, you, you can't finance high-rise development for 15, on a 15-year mortgage, especially when you're trying to go for the middle class and and all the other social values that were embedded in Mitchell Lama. So I've, I found that really interesting. Well, I mean, the whole idea was that you could get to profitability. I think that banks or developers looked at it as a much more positive 
situation because the earlier timeout meant that it was essentially a better investment. I would also argue that they were willing to invest at a higher quality level because of the expectation of profit. Well, they could amortize it faster. Uh, and maybe be, maybe the subsidies were handsome enough that they, they could do that. I mean, to bring it up to current times, you know, that whether it's 15 years, 35 years, or 40 years, when that stock goes back into the private market, it's a real problem for a city like New York. Uh, and uh, except for Waterside, I don't, which we Travis spent a lot of years trying to keep in uh, the Mitchell Lama kind of framework. I don't know of how many have retained their affordable housing. Right. Um, there's been a great loss in them. Uh, but I would say that just to go back to how states shape things differently, right? Uh, the notion, I, I kind of think about it this way, is Mitchell Lama or I think some UDC projects are part of kind of putting New York City in the broader metropolitan picture. So the idea that there isn't permanent subsidized housing, they're coming off of already, if you read a lot of the, the work on Mitchell Lama, they're already saying, well, it's a problem that public housing is a permanently low income thing. It's, it's a problem that it's off the, that from, for people who've lived there a long time and consider it to be, you know, low, low rent as a kind of right of living in those places, it's a problem. Uh, but to kind of go back to how states are different, I don't think, they didn't have a problem with the idea that you would basically create something very attractive for private developers to come in and then in the end they'd worry, again that's the complex results part, We'll worry about it, you know, way down the road. But the, their their crisis right then was the massive disinvestment in well, cities. And, yeah. and not only that, they didn't want housing off the tax rolls that for, forever. Okay, because if you remember the '50s and the '60s, cities are losing people to the suburbs, and that hits the fiscal bottom line of the city's budget. So there are a lot of complex things that explain. I just want to mention that um, in Roosevelt Island today we were going into whatever buildings we could get into and there were there were some uh, little memos posted on the walls about a great victory that had taken was really people's mobilizing to get but when one of the there was Mitchell Lama the UDC took advantage mm -hmm. of Mitchell Lama for the middle income housing that they wanted in this kind of utopian social mix of low income, middle in moderate income, mid middle income. But anyway, there was going to be an expiration. And uh, the, there was a lot of mobilization of people, uh, residents on Roosevelt Island, and they managed to get a really great deal that the state ultimately offered, which was in a building, um, one of the buildings that was where this was expiring, uh, they, people could buy their units for 30% of the market value, which is pretty fabulous, or continue to rent at rents that were going to be very carefully monitored, and, and the increases would be carefully monitored. And so, you know, I think today, you know, the only way to really fight this is for people to just really play the, the political game yeah. and to just really put a lot of pressure on, and I don't know how successful that's been across the board. I mean, I think a lot of the money for preservation over the years has been used to basically extend uh, these kinds of deals. But I, I would say you mentioned about a 30% purchase. You know, I mean, that, that assumes that people have capital, right? It's still this kind of like middle... Loans available. I, exactly, yes, right. And I, I would just stress again, and we, you know, so we're talking about 42nd, who is 42nd Street for, right? And that development, right? It's who supposed to bring right? the middle class back to the city. Right, so there's a very... It's safe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. And, and I think that's partly because these things are shaped, partly like you were saying, Linda, but they're shaped in Albany, they, that you kind of, there still is a kind of background of kind of mainstream consensus that it has to meet. The state, for instance, had a public housing program. Guess what? After a decade or, or two of it, the voters refused to uh, approve any more of it. Right? It was not politically popular outside, even inside New York City, as you may know. Right? Um, so again, these things kind of have to pass that kind of consensus, mainstream, middle class litmus test to basically gain, I think, a lot of that political support. Obviously, things are maybe changing in Albany. I'm just saying that historically, that's how it was. Right, so um, we have 15 minutes left, and it seems like a good time to turn to questions to the audience. I know we have a lot, we have people 
in government here, people who have been in government, and I see someone has already uh, got it poised with the microphone. So go ahead and ask your question. You can maybe people can introduce themselves sure. just so we know. I know who you are, but they don't. <laughs> I didn't, I, one, could you I stand talked at all about the cost of maintaining housing. Yeah. And the longer than a 40-year mortgage, most pieces of the hou any housing comp complex requires major reinvestment in its basic system. I think that one of the reasons that this federal government pulled out of public housing is the sheer cost of continuing to rebuild it without having oh. a new building was so expensive that the, the idea of continuing for every year the same expenses for the same housing was intolerable. And I think it's the same reason why the state's program has ended too. And why Congress actually required that um, <clears throat> any new capital expenses of the federal government had to be, um, um, their, their cost over time had to be um, accounted for. Mm -hmm. And so it made, it's made the federal government budget much larger as a result of recognizing the costs of reinvestment or paying out mortgage <laughs> sums year after year. We have a, a Nick. When I first met Nick, he'd just written a book about uh, NYCHA, and he was a great supporter. He said, New York oh, City has the best public housing in the country. You know, it's livable, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, and now here we are, and that was many years ago. And, yeah. you know, New York is not alone in having public housing that has deteriorated because there hasn't been right. that maintenance. So, you know, there really, I guess, hasn't been the provision for how that's going to happen. May I add one element to that, too, is that, in fact, preserving the middle-class Mitchell Lama, like Co-op City, right, that required additional state aid, right, and security, right? So there is, I think, also a, a willingness to kind of, like, invest in a middle income, for instance, in preser a lot of the preservation programs addressed, like you were talking about with Roosevelt Island, right? There's a, there, I think there is, it's not since this basically two-tier kind of system, right? which is that things that very poor people uh, live in, that is not considered to be worth a long-term investment. Uh, so public housing, I think, has suffered from that reputational element. Whereas middle-income things, I think about, let's think about the deal that has preserved Stuyvesant Town, right? That's a middle-income uh, rescue plan, right? And I think nobody, que nobody questioned that. We talk about NYCHA, for instance. People say, well, why would we spend this money, you know, these sort of things? Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with how things are targeted. So I think that middle, when, when we talk about these kind of particular state programs that target middle-income people, it's a lot easier to kind of sell in the public that these places will be preserved because there's a more positive view of what they contribute to the city. So I would just remind you uh, that, you know, there was a big rent strike at yeah. Co-op City. It yeah. didn't come so easily. No, it didn't. Uh, but they still came through in the end. Yeah. Because middle-income housing pay higher rent, it's somewhat more the long-term upkeep. Well, right. One of the things that um, hasn't come up tonight is the um, subsidy that uh, the city and the state put into luxury housing. Um, and it seems like, you know, there's been the, a change in, I, I don't know what things were like 20, 30 years ago, but there's a tremendous influence that the real estate sector has had in Albany and certainly in, in, in the city. and you know, with a, an absence of real uh, campaign finance reform measures. But, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, places like Hudson Yards, where maybe there's not uh, so much uh, uh, dollars that have directly f uh, gone from the city into, directly into the pockets of developers, but the city put $2 billion into extending the 7, seven train to Hudson Yards. And, uh, you know, there's been, for years, uh, tremendous uh, tax abatements that were given to uh, essentially market rate housing uh, below 96th Street. So I'm just wondering if you can kind of comment, how does that fit into, you know, your view of um, how kind of power and dollars are being used today to meet the needs of affordable housing? Well, the 
the tax subsidies going into luxury housing are city tax subsidies, by and large. They're 421A, the old 421A program, and, and uh, I think many of the subsidies, not all of them, went to the wrong kind of projects that did nothing for affordable housing. Um, so put that aside for a minute. Uh, I do take exception with the prevailing notion that a $2 billion investment in the extension of the 7 line is a subsidy. It is not a subsidy. It is an investment in the future growth of the city that opens up far west midtown. And it actually is city money, even though it's an MTA subway line, which is state, because the 7 line was never an a priority for the MTA, but it was a priority for Mayor Bloomberg uh, to open up Far West Midtown, even though the stimulus was the hope to get the Olympics. It was clearly, when you, when you put in a bid for the Olympics, you need to show the legacy impact of the investments made to bring the Olympics to a city. And clearly, the subway was a big part of that. And, you know, it's, it's an investment for the next 50, 100 years in the city's growth. Peter, I would just also put it in that your observation in a larger context of the tools that cities now have to work with, which are pretty limited. And they, have re they really are forced, in many cases, to just squeeze what they can out of private development. And that's what a lot of these competitions for the Amazons, you know, come down to, or Boston made a big play for GE, it gave them all kinds of things, and then GE kind of decided it, well, wasn't doing very well, and it's now actually exiting. Um, and Boston wanted Amazon, fortunately didn't get it, uh, as far as many of us are concerned. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I do think in the way forcing a certain percentage of affordable units in a market rate project or payment into a, you know, a fund instead. So it's really the kind of larger context of, I think, the, the kind of disappearance of the kind of federal dollars that cities, I think, really need to do this job and then forcing them into some, I'm not going to excuse all the things that are happening, but I, I really think we have to look at the options that cities have and they're not great right now. A city like New York, because of the wealth of the city body as a whole, has put real dollars for decades into affordable housing. It's never enough, okay? Especially when you, you, you think about going further down into real affordability and dealing with the homeless problem. It's never enough. It's a bottomless sink of need. Uh, but given the resources that New York City has, there have been a lot done that other cities could not have done, okay? Uh, and it's not all been through tax abatements. Well, that's the other thing, just to pick up on that. I mean, we're also seeing, a, you know, a nation of cities that are flourishing uh, and cities that are failing. And, you know, a city, Amazon wasn't interested in going to Baltimore or Cleveland or Newark or many of this, or Detroit, or many of the cities that would have benefited enormously. But they were really trying to find places where they thought the talent that they are seeking would want to live. And so we are kind of concentrating a lot of these resources, I think, in certain places. Can I add something? We were both at the uh, conference in Arlington uh, where Amy Lou from Brookings talked about the deal that actually went through, uh, which could be much better, not just for the employers who want them, uh, but a lot of that investment that's being made, for instance, in Arlington, is about increasing the quality of education in the region and other resources. Um, just to kind of back up a little bit, though, I, I think it's important, since we're all basically involved in a historical enterprise here, uh, to remember, again, uh, what cities were like back in the 1960s when people thought, or 70s, when these uh, projects were put together, these large-scale projects in particular, uh, because there really wasn't, I know, for, for my students here and so forth, that you talk about an urban crisis and investment, it all seems very uh, sort of abstract, all right? But it was a real thing, um, and if some of these projects maybe seem a little over the top, and of course didn't work out, right, exactly the way people had hoped, uh, that was because the environment, the economic environment, and, you know, the, the difference between making it and not making it was very slim, right, for a city like New York. 
Um, so uh, I would just, I would say a lot of these, again, large scale projects, uh, in a way, made much more sense, you know, 30, 40 years ago. I'm from Brooklyn, I don't need a mic. <laughs> um, I'm Miriam Allen, I worked with Mr. Logue on the South Bronx oh, redevelopment okay. plan. And, There's uh, another one right over there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're, we're still alive. Um, I wanted to just get a sense of what you would think of the public policy uh, implications that changed New York City from a city of renters toward a city of owners. Um, in the early 80s, late 70s, there was this mass number of uh, co-op conversions that had to be, um, you know, funneled through the state attorney general's office, you know, creating um, these uh, HDFCs, um, creating um, private uh, co-op corporations where some uh, wealth was um, created in certain areas that are now, you know, ultra luxury. But um, I really think that uh, when you talk about the historical perspective, there there was a time, um, approximately when Mr. Reagan became president that there was this uh, public policy of incentivizing turning renters into owners. That I think the, now there are lots of problems with Mitchell-Lama and so forth, um, but I think the attractiveness of the cooperative idea as the state pioneered it was certainly one factor uh, in encouraging uh, basically these kinds of conversions. On the other hand, we know that it was a kind of wild west, right, in terms of the, the conversions that actually happened during this period. I want to, I mean, I think it's such an important point. And um, I think we've come to recognize, uh, you know, in recent years, how much advantage home owners have had in the post-war period. When, you know, we try to understand why we have so much inequality in our society today that often follows racial lines, what we're realizing is that, you know, white middle class people were able to buy property in suburban communities in many cases. And when many minority populations were living in places that were redlined, there wasn't that possibility to buy to at least, and to buy property that would appreciate. And our whole sort of structure, economic structure of, of benefits to homeowners through tax, tax benefits, property tax deductions, you know, um, your mortgage deductions, everything was really aimed at, you know, creating a society of homeowners. And renters, I mean, when my parents grew up in New York, they were renters. They said they would move every time the apartment needed to be painted, you know, <laughs> that, um, you know, that That's just was... landlords painted apartments. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, that, that was just a, a completely different set of assumptions. Um, but I do think over the post-war period, we have become a society, and not just by our own, you know, sort of discovery. I mean, it's been president after ship. So I think that you know what happened in New York would New York probably lag behind much of what was happening in the country. Um, so that would I think it's a very important point. I, I think your question related mostly to assisted housing to affordable housing. No. Oh, okay. But in the seventies, remember every city was going through some kind of urban crisis, and landlords felt, rightly or wrongly that they could not support the rental housing on the income they were getting. There was the, co the, the, the conversion to co-ops or condominiums after the enabling legislation for condominiums, which had to be created, was nationwide. I mean, I remember this in Boston when I was there. Nationwide, they just, they just said, take it. And in the 70s in New York City, you could have gotten incredible bargains if you could pay the maintenance about mar the private market capitalist approach to providing housing. We always, we always like to, I guess, there you go. We always like to end our programs on time. It's 8 o'clock, so we're going to wrap up. I want to have a couple of things I want to say as part of wrapping up. One is that 
your conversation on these topics can continue in two ways. One of which is the authors will be upstairs signing books where books are for sale on your way out. The other is that this entire program kind of underscores the fact that this conversation needs to continue in a broad way of bringing the state back into our analysis of a lot of these discussions. The idea of uh, Washington abandoning the cities starting in 1980 um, is one that's well built into the scholarship and our focus on city policies is very rich, but bringing the state back into that analysis, and in particular, I would say that um, we often, when we do bring the state in, we focus in recent times on the, the person-to-person -person dysfunction of the relationship of the city to the governor, and, uh, the mayor to the governor. And in fact, the institutional arrangements and the policy arrangements are really important for us to understand and bring into the analysis. So that's, that's one of the takeaways. The other thing I would say, just I want to end where I started, which is go to the Skyscraper Museum, see this awesome exhibit, come back to Roosevelt House and see our great programs, what a lineup this has been. And then the last thing, the other little gem that I want to throw in a, 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 a push for is if you know young people that want to study urban policy and urban planning, the Hunter program is the best there is. <laughs>